This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. Right from the very beginning of our study of personal tax, the taxation of individuals, we've seen that each individual, whether adult, child, male, female, married or single, each individual is taxable in their own right, and they have their own various tax computations. We, in Chapter 2, are looking at income tax computations. We'll later move on to look at capital gains tax computations, and eventually, at the end, very appropriately at the end, IHT computations there. And each taxpayer has their own separate computation. They are taxed independently in terms of the UK taxation system. But when dealing with married couples, we get some interesting situations. To begin with, starting here in income tax, with, in Section 7, dealing with jointly owned assets of a married couple. Or, of course, again, whenever we talk about a married couple, we're also talking about any couples in civil partnerships. It is quite common, of course, for such married couples to have jointly owned assets. They might have a joint bank deposit account. They may be fortunate enough to own a separate property that they rent out. And again, it is jointly owned. So we have interest income. We have property income deriving from those assets. So that's therefore owned by each of those spouses. So what are we going to do? Because that income does not go to a joint computation. It has to be separated out and split between the spouses. And here we have a very, very simple rule. It's the logical one that you might think in terms of now, and we'll know it as the 50-50 rule that will apply. First, as we've just said, the spouses and civil partners are taxed as two separate people. Each spouse or civil partner has their own income tax computation. That's what we're dealing with here. And we include within it their own taxable income. Equally, as I said, they're saying they have their own individual CGT computation and eventually IHT computation that we'll discuss in later chapters. What happens, therefore, where they own an asset jointly? Well, as we said, we're going to have a very simple rule where these spouses or civil partners do own income generating assets on a joint basis. It is assumed that they are entitled to equal shares of the income and it's split accordingly on a 50-50 basis between them. Yep, we've got the 50-50 rule. So it's ever so easy if you've got a joint bank account, a deposit account from which you earn interest, you split that interest received equally between the two spouses, half going to his computation, half going to her computation, or whatever the case may be. It is split evenly. They jointly own a rental property. Again, it is split equally between those two spouses or civil partners. They each get half of what would otherwise have been assessable. However, they may make a joint election to HMRC. Now, taxpayers have the opportunity to make elections as regards the particular treatment of a particular item in a particular tax. Wherever that election is available, clearly it will only be used by the taxpayer if it gains them some taxation benefit. We're not going to elect to do something that is not beneficial or doesn't change it. We're going to make an election, we're going to go to the trouble of doing this if it improves our tax position. So what we have the ability to do is to make the election here, joint election, both spouses, civil partners must agree to it, to HMRC, to split the income according to their actual ownership proportions. Now then, we're not talking about an election available for the spouses, civil partners, I just keep saying spouses now, for the spouses to be able to split that income assessment any way they like between them. That is not the case. The election, if we move away from the 50-50 rule, the election is to go for actual ownership. Now, if we're talking about actual ownership, we can't really do that in the form of bank interest there. So except in the case of jointly held bank or building society accounts, if they're in joint names, it is the 50-50 rule. This election does not apply. 
But when you see it mostly being applicable and mostly being tested here in any exam scenario, is in relation to property income, a jointly owned property. So the rules allow couples to rearrange joint income between them to get the better use of their personal allowances and lower tax rates, thereby reducing their overall tax liabilities. Now remember, it is not an election to split it any which way you like. It is an election to split it according to actual ownership. So there must be something defined, therefore, what that legal actual ownership is. Now, you're not going to have to worry about that and about how you get that. It will be given to you in an examination question. But it is a division according to actual ownership there. Now, again, as we've said, we're only going to make such an election if it is of benefit to the taxpayers. And we mentioned a couple of issues here to get better use of their personal allowances. If we've got one of the two spouses who is not using all of their personal allowance, then that is a level of tax-free income that is being wasted. So if we've got the other spouse who's paying basic rate tax on their joint income, or even, and in a greater sense here, higher rate tax, then wouldn't it be a good idea if some of that income, by making this election to move to a division into actual ownership, away from simply the 50-50 rule, if that moves income from the taxpayer who would have been paying basic rate tax or higher rate tax to the taxpayer who actually won't pay any tax on it at all. Why? Because when the income moves into their income tax computation, it simply co is covered by the personal allowance. They use more of the personal allowance. So their net income increases, but the taxable income doesn't. We might move from 5,000 to 10,000 pounds worth of income. The personal allowance, as we know, is 12,500 pounds. And on that basis, there won't be any tax to pay on that other 5,000. If we move that 5,000 from a basic rate taxpayer, well, they'd have been paying 20% tax on 5,000. That's a thousand pounds tax that would have been paid on that income. If it had been a higher rate taxpayer, then in that situation, that higher rate taxpayer would have paid 40%. And now to move it to the tax paying spouse that has available a personal allowance still unused, it's going to save 5,000 at 40%, £2,000. So it could get better use of the personal allowance. You obviously know, of course, that where you have a situation where for the tax year in question on the tax computations, one taxpayer has some unused personal allowance. It is possible in relation to such a tax year depending on when the election is made, for us to transfer an amount of that personal allowance. It goes in the form of a tax credit, the transferability of the married couple's allowance there. That allows you to transfer it across for the other spouse to benefit from. But that is very limited. Only £1,250 worth of that personal allowance and that then only achieves a 10% credit in, sorry, 20% credit in relation to that spouse, the transferee spouse. It's also only available where you're dealing with the other spouse, the transferee spouse, having, of course, just being a basic rate taxpayer. Wouldn't be applicable if the taxpayer was a higher rate taxpaying spouse. So, notwithstanding the ability to transfer a bit of that personal allowance across in order to benefit at basic rate tax the other transferee spouse. Notwithstanding that, we are talking here about potentially much bigger numbers in the context of achieving a tax saving, moving several thousands of pounds worth of income away from a basic rate tax payer to a non-tax payer, away from a higher rate tax payer to a non-tax payer. Now that, of course, is only talking about where the one spouse is not paying any tax at all. Their income levels at the moment are less than their level of personal allowance. 
But even if both taxpayer spouses have taxable income, if one is a basic rate taxpayer spouse and the other is a higher rate taxpayer spouse, then moving the income from being taxable at 40% to being taxable at 20% is going to achieve a net 20% saving. So are additional rate down to basic rate. Then we'd be talking about 25% saving. Now that's a significant percentage saving on what might be several thousand pounds worth of income. So this is worth looking at. So let's see what we've got here then. The 50-50 rule may also be used to reduce income tax liabilities where a higher rate taxpayer currently owns outright an income producing asset while their spouse is not fully using either their personal allowance or basic rate band. So now we're talking about a slightly different issue. We started from the premise that the asset in question is already in joint ownership. And that joint ownership begets the 50-50 rule, whereby they split the income equally. If it means, therefore, that one of those two spouses is not using all their basic rate band, and or one of those spouses is going to be a basic rate taxpayer instead of a higher or additional rate taxpayer, then it makes sense. If we can, if the actual ownership is such that it will allow this election to be made to split on the actual ownership basis. If it moves income from the higher rate to a basic rate taxpayer, from a higher or basic to a non-taxpayer, then that's a good idea and it's going to achieve 20% or 40% saving. Moving it from basic to, sorry, moving it from higher rate to basic rate will achieve a 20% saving. So we're talking about the use of the personal allowance, we're talking about there the different rates of tax, one taxpayer spouse being a higher level of tax paying spouse than the other in terms of the rates that are paid. But what we may have is a situation where we actually don't have a jointly owned asset at this point, that one of the spouses owns that asset. Now, if one of the taxpayers solely owns that asset in their own right, then all of the income is their income, and it goes to their income tax computation. But if we were to put that asset into joint ownership, then that would mean that it's the same amount of income that will be taxable overall, but it would now be split 50-50, meaning that if we could again move income away from the higher rate taxpayer to the basic rate taxpayer, then this makes sense. Makes sense in the context of overall the married couple or the civil partners will achieve a tax saving that may run into several thousand pounds, depending on how much income and how much basic rate band or unused personal allowance that exists. So two ways by which we might see this. If you face it within an income tax computation that you're told Here's his income, here's her income. Oh, and by the way, this is a jointly owned property and this is their income here. This is a jointly held bank deposit account. This is the interest on that account. Then, as such, each of those sources of income, you will simply split 50-50 and put into the income tax computation. If it then, as it may in a section C question, invite a discussion, as to how an improvement could be made in relation to the taxpayers, are there any beneficial claims or elections that are available? Then we would look to see, and the question has got to tell you this, what is the actual ownership of that particular asset? Now, in relation to the bank deposit account there, that's irrelevant because the election to split according to actual does not apply. It is simply 50-50, end of story. But on the property income, should there be such, then they're going to tell you, well, actually, this is actually owned 75%, 25%. Now, if it was that the basic rate taxpayer owned 75% and the higher rate taxpayer spouse owned 25%, then at the moment, it's being split 50-50. Make the election and more of that income 
would now be allocated to the basic rate taxpayer spouse. If that taxpayer spouse owns 75%, the higher rate taxpayer actually owns just 25%, then that would move income away from the higher rate taxpayer spouse and into the basic rate taxpayer spouse, into their computation. That's going to achieve a net saving of 20% on that income transfer. The other situation that we may get is, here's the married couple, here's their amounts of income, work out what taxable income they have got, and one of those spouses owns entirely a particular property, a rental property produces property income. And what could we do? Well, again, what could happen now is it could be put into, <coughs> pardon me, it could be put into joint ownership. That joint ownership is not going to be 50-50. You can decide and enforce it legally what the actual ownership split would be. But even if that was, say, 5 or 10% compared to 95 or 90%, it's now in joint ownership. And on that basis, if we went from single ownership to joint ownership, then half of the income due to the 50-50 rule would now move to the other spouse. If the other spouse is paying tax at a lower rate, or indeed is not paying tax at all, and they have some unused personal allowance, then being able to move income out of a higher rate of tax to a lower rate of tax or to no tax at all because we're using up some on currently unused personal allowance that has to be a good idea all right we're going to do some examples on this in a moment but just picking up what i said there for this individual here where a higher rate taxpayer currently owns outright an income producing asset let us assume a rental property while their spouse is not fully use it, utilizing either their personal allowance or and or their basic rate band, then a transfer of a nominal amount of the capital ownership, as we just said, for example, 5%, would allow 50% of the income to be assessed on the transferee spouse. Clearly, if the taxpayer was happy to transfer the entire ownership of the asset to the spouse, then an even greater overall amount of tax would be saved. And here, of course, you have an issue. If you have got, at the moment, uh, the asset in the hands of one spouse entirely, and that is, say, a property, then that property could be of significant value. It could be several hundred thousand pounds in value. And we are talking about that one spouse transferring some proportion of ownership to the other spouse. Hmm, that would be an interesting discussion to have with your clients, wouldn't it? As you've got the married couple sat across the table from you there, and you come up with this great idea that, oh yes, I've got a great idea how to save you some tax. Now then, uh, Mrs. So-and-so, you own that particular property, you get all that income, you're a higher rate taxpayer. Husband, you're only a basic rate taxpayer. I've got a great idea. You transfer the ownership of that property across to him. It'll go silent for a moment in the office where the good lady wife will be here. Hmm, we'll talk about this later, maybe. Whereas the husband will be, what a good idea that is. Yes, you transfer that £300,000 property into my name there. And that means, yes, we'll save some income tax. But that's now his asset rather than her asset. So when he takes that asset, if he decides to not just take the asset but leave, then of course that's his asset. It's been transferred. You can't just pretend that it's his. This is a legal transfer of one to the other. Now, of course, she may consider it's a reasonable price to pay to get rid of it. I don't know. Not us, but us to, uh, to think of such things, of course. But we do have the capacity here of moving income, either taking a joint asset, jointly owned asset, and creating this, making this election to split in actual ownership, or taking an individual owned asset, transferring it entirely to the other spouse, or putting it into joint ownership, whereby income is going to be moving from 
and it's only going to be beneficial to do this where it's moving from the higher rate to the basic rate taxpayer or the higher or basic rate taxpayer to the non-taxpayer spouse. In those circumstances, it would be worthwhile. The issue, of course, if we're talking about a high value asset, is whether the individual who currently owns that property, if one individual owns it outright, are they happy to transfer it entirely to the other spouse? Maybe not. But maybe that's where a compromise comes in, that the wife there is not happy to transfer the entire ownership of the property across to this waste of space husband of hers. But what she is willing to do is to put, say, 5% into his ownership. They'll own it 95.5. And from that, their 50-50 rule will then apply because it is joint income. And that means that some, at least, of the income that would have suffered at her higher rate will now suffer at his lower basic rate. So there's compromises here to be made. Right, let's just run you through a little example to illustrate how that may work. Hopefully, from what we've discussed, though I know we've gone through it quite quickly there, you're picking up the idea of this planning issue that could be brought into play. As I've said, in terms of an exam question, there may be no planning issue at all. It is simply, this is a jointly owned asset. Here is the overall total income assessment for our tax year. It's £10,000. You split it, therefore, 50-50. We are able, again, as we've said here, to make this election to uh, split it according to actual ownership. That will only be effective, of course, after that election has been made. It can't be made retrospectively here. It will only be relevant for the future. But let's have a little example just to illustrate here what may be happening. Right, put some numbers on it. Now, I've got a simple little example here where we're doing income tax computations for the 2021 tax year. And we've got husband and we've got wife there, hubby and wife. Two sources of income. Well, two for the wife, one for the husband. They both have employment income. Husband, as you can see there, with some £25,000 worth of salary and wife with £60,000. Wife also has property income, £20,000. Didn't he do well? Oh, yes, he's married very well, hubby has here. So he ends up with both total and net income of £25,000. And the good lady wife has got 80,000. Now, the 80,000 is less than 100,000. There's no issue about adjusted net income being excess of 100,000. And therefore, both spouses get individually and utilise in full their personal allowances, bringing, therefore, their figures of taxable income down to £12,500, therefore all to be charged at basic rate for the husband, and £67,500 for the wife. Now, again, uh, given what we know about our differing tax rates, when your taxable income goes above £37,500, we move from basic to higher rate band, subject, of course, to any extension of that basic rate band through the payments that have been made by that spouse. But on that basis, there is, in 67 and a half, the first 37,500 would be at basic. 30,000 of that 67,500 would therefore be at higher rate. So 20,000, that property income, is effectively all in her hands now being taxed at, well, yeah, you got it, it's being taxed at 40%. So that means that on that 20,000 pounds, Effectively, she, they, I suppose, effectively, are suffering 40%, £8,000 in tax. That is a lot of tax to pay. So what could be done? Well, again, if everything is wonderful in the household there between them, there may not be a problem in terms of her transferring, indeed, the ownership of that property in full, absolutely, across to the husband. That means, therefore, that for the future, if that 20,000 then featured here in terms of the husband's computation and moves out of her computation, 
We're adding 20,000 to his taxable income, so that would put it up to 32,500. And we're reducing the 67,500 by 20,000. That's coming to 47,500. Well, again, we don't have to be Einstein to see what would happen. Before this, while it was absolutely individually owned by her, the 20,000 was taxed at 40%, and that therefore was £8,000 tax. We now move that across to the husband. That means it's still all within his basic rate band, still, still some basic rate band available. And therefore, that self-same £20,000 of taxable income is going to be taxed at 20%. That's £4,000. There we have a £4,000 tax saving. I'm sure we'd agree that that is very worthwhile having. And that will be year, obviously with property income, you don't know exactly what levels of net property income you will have for any given tax year. The allowable expenses may change. We may move out. One tenant may move out. We may get another tenant in. Rental prices may go up. They may go down. It could be different. But on a basis of that 20000 there, we are talking in terms of an annual tax saving, income tax saving, of some £4,000. That has got to be worth having. Now, that assumed that she was more than happy, well, maybe happy, not more than, uh, to transfer the ownership of the property across. If she was reluctant to do that, then what could happen for future reference would be that she transfers some, again, nominal amount of ownership, 5%, 10%, whatever it might be, such as to turn it from an individually owned property into a jointly owned property. And what that would mean is that £10,000 of income, we apply the 50-50 rule on a jointly owned asset. £10,000 of income will now move out of her computation, so hers will reduce to 10000 and the other 10000 that comes across to him. That 10000 out of the higher rate, where there would have been £4,000 worth of tax thereon, into the basic rate taxpayer spouse computation, 20% tax, therefore a saving of £2,000. Not as good as £4,000 a year, of course not, but it still leaves the transfer or spouse in terms of this property transfer. It still leaves that transfer or spouse with the majority, the vast majority of ownership, 90, 95%, whatever figure they have decided to come up with. So there's a sort of compromise that might be suggestible probably just to the wife rather than in open forum. Not that that's going to be tested in your exam, but in practical terms, their uh, suggestion to make to the wife, she then wanted to consider that, then a joint discussion could be had, of course. But we can see significant tax saving would be achieved. What we also have there, though we haven't dealt with it yet, and we're not going to deal with it in detail, well, we're not going to deal with it now, we're just going to make the point, is that when you move a property such as we've done there, a property which for CGT is a chargeable asset, and when sold, if at a profit, then a capital gain would be computed if one were to be made, and uh, then that capital gain would be taxed on the individual owner. Then if you have transfers of a property, then are there CGT implications? Well, ordinarily, yes. If an individual disposes of a property or an interest in that property, then that would give rise to a chargeable disposal of a chargeable asset by a chargeable person, a term we'll come to know and love when we look at CGT, and therefore a gain would arise. But that does not happen when dealing with, and again it's both spouses and civil partnerships here, civil partners, where one spouse or civil partner transfers an asset to another, then there is going to be no gain that would arise, or indeed, depending on the value of the property, no loss. They are said to be no gain, no loss transfers. There will be neither a gain nor a loss to compute. There is no chargeable disposal that's taken place. So we've got the income tax advantage of the transfer, moving income from a higher to a lower rate of tax, even possibly no tax if it uses it for 
what would otherwise be an unused personal allowance. We can also note, if it's required in the exam question, that the transfer for CGT purposes between spouses would be a no gain, no loss transfer, and that means there would be no CGT to worry about. And further, we know very little about this, but IHT then transfers between spouses are also said to be exempt. So there would be no potential for IHT to arise in relation to that transfer. That's all you need to know. So there's no CGT on the transfer, there's no IHT implications on the transfer, the CGT no gain no loss transfer for IHT exempt transfer. And what we do then get is the income tax saving year on year through moving income from 40 to 20 or 20 to 0 or 40 to 0 or 45 to any of the other lower levels there. That is the advantage to be achieved. So there is a planning issue at stake here. Right, more of that in a short while. But what I'd now like you to do, please, is just have a little look at, or not just a little look at, have a go at, uh, you can just do a notational answer here to example 16, discuss how Elton and David could reduce their income tax liabilities. So I won't spoil this for you. Over to you, therefore. Again, just pause the lecture at this point. You look at the information that is given to about each of those taxpayers and see if you can, at least in notational form, don't just read the answer in the back. I'll talk you through that once you've had a go. But have a proper go at it. You don't have to write it out in full. But what you do have to do is think through what are the issues, what are the points, and note them down. Then check the answer, then come back to this, and I'll quickly talk you through that answer. And we'll just deal with a couple of other issues and bring the lecture to a close. OK, hopefully, therefore, we picked up what the issues here were between Alton and David, so to speak, and the uh, advantage to be gained by moving some, if not all, of the ownership of the income-producing asset, the property there, from Alton, where it's currently suffering a higher rate tax charge, and over to David, where some part of that income, at least, would suffer no tax at all, given that he has no income, and therefore the entire personal allowance is unused at this point in time. OK, what have we got there for? Uh, one possibility, of course, is to simply move it from single to joint ownership. And that can be done with a nominal amount of transfer. Again, there's no one right answer to this. We can put in uh, whatever percentage we wish. But putting it into joint ownership, and that would therefore mean that as a jointly owned asset, we'll split the income 50-50. Elton's tax liability will be reduced by £4,000. There was £20,000 of property income going to his computation. That's going to move 10000 of that away. 10000 that was at a marginal rate of 40%. There would have been a tax of £4,000. That now won't be incurred. Over it comes to David's computation. There's the other 10,000 coming in, uh, more than covered by the personal allowance, no tax liability. Therefore, the couple will save what we're talking about there, £4,000. If Elton transfers the entire ownership, then all the income would be assessed on David and his taxable income, he would now have a taxable income, would be some 7,500, where from he's now 20,000 pounds worth of property income. There would be a personal allowance of 12,500 and therefore taxable income of 7,500. All of that, of course, at basic rate, so a 20% tax liability, and that would amount to 1,500 pounds. Compared to Elton's current tax liability on the property income, where all of the 20,000 would be taxed at 40% and therefore 8,000 pounds worth of uh, tax would have been paid. So we can see that we can reduce what would have been 8,000 down to 1,500 and therefore achieve a tax saving, achieving a total tax saving there of 6,500 pounds. Again, in anybody's money, well, maybe not Elton's money, to be fair, but most normal people's money anyway, 
that is a very significant figure and therefore something to be taken advantage of. Point that we made earlier that we'll just pick up on, the election of course to transfer £1,250 of the personal allowance from David to Elton would not be available here as Elton is not a basic rate taxpayer. So even though we got this unused personal allowance of 12,500 going from one year to another at current year 2021 rates, that is, there would be no possibility of making a transfer across to Elton because you can only do that 10% transfer, that £1,250 transfer to go as a tax credit uh, for the transfer respouse if the transferee spouse is not greater than a basic rate taxpayer. Out in a clearly higher rate, that is not possible here. Okay, hopefully therefore there are some things to think about. And what I'd also like you to do, rather than just thinking about and going back over this session before next session, is to move forward to uh, chapter 26, the very final chapter, and it's labelled tax planning style questions here and I want you to read through just the first couple of parts of this. The introduction that tells you what the examining team are now doing compared to what they did some years ago in terms of the basic tax paper and by comparison to the advanced tax paper and what that has led to is the introduction of these planning style questions. If you're going to get one, it's probably going to be the 10 mark question in terms of section C, where again, it is likely to be, as these notes will indicate, multi-tax. Now again, don't start worrying about it at this point. We barely know much about one tax, let alone multiple taxes and how they may impact in terms of an individual transaction. That will become more apparent as we go through the course and as we develop the knowledge. But the first little bit, and off the back of what we've just been discussing here, this first individual area deals with married couples and civil partners. And as you can see there, it references what we've just been dealing with, section seven of chapter two. And I'd just like you to read through the points made here. It builds on top of what we've just been doing which is a fundamental and really important planning point. But to also look at other issues. It also brings in the other taxes, which again, if you recall, I mentioned just a little while ago about how the capital taxes are there known. Capital gains tax, CGT, and inheritance tax, IHT, won't be an issue where we have transfers of assets between spouses or civil partners. And just read down through to illustration one. Don't worry about having a go at illustration one. I'll take you through that at the beginning of the next session there. But just have a little read through. I'll go through it again with you. But a little bit of reading of that before we start the lecture should allow you to understand the issues that we deal with rather more easily and quickly than might otherwise have been the case. But first of all, of course, get to grips with what we've just done. I should look forward to seeing you next time.